Everybody, it's really good to be back. The last time I was here was about five years ago, I think. It was four or five years ago. It was during our last furlough. I was alone at the time. Barbara was not with me because our son Caleb was in his last year of high school and, um, and classes had already started and so she was with him because it wasn't a good idea to leave him alone at that time. And so, so that's why she was not here with me. But anyway, I'm really, really glad she's here with me this time. Um, we do miss the kids, you know. The kids used to, our children used to travel with us everywhere on our furloughs um, when they were with us. And so we'd all get up and sing. And that was a lot of fun, but um, not that this isn't, but it's just different without, without them. And, uh, but anyway, we're thankful for, for them and their lives. Um, we do have seven children, for those of you who are just now meeting us, maybe, and I do recognize some, some of you all, but I, I believe there's some new people here, too, also. Um, we do have seven children. We were married for 12 years before we had any children. We had lost three in those first 12 years of marriage, but then God saw fit to give us seven children in seven years, so be careful what you pray for. <laughs> um, so uh, God gave us two biological children, and then we were able to adopt a sibling group of five Peruvian orphaned children, and they're all grown up and gone now, uh, gone from our, our home anyway, uh, but they're all, they, they all love the Lord, and we're just thankful that God has been working in their lives. Flora, the oldest, and her husband are missionaries in the jungle of Peru, a different jungle than where we are. Okay, we're in the jungle, but they're in a different part of the jungle, about 18 hours from where we are. Um, and they are starting another church in a town called Pilcopata. They have three children. So yes, we don't look like grandparents, but we are. <laughs> I know I look like grandpa. But um, our, our, our second is Fernando, and he and his wife are uh, active in the last church we started in Peru, the church in Naring, and we're thankful for that. They have two children also. And then um, uh, Freddie would be the next one. I got to remember all this. Here's Flora, Fernando, Freddie, yes, the three Fs. So Freddie, um, he uh, lives in Florida. He works in the computer field and, and actually travels quite a bit. Um, to different places, but um, he, he is doing well also, and we're thankful for him. He, he lives in uh, Navarre, Florida. Our son Caesar also works in the same field as Freddie, and he, um, they actually uh, are, live together. They have the same address. They are not married, um, but they do, um, they do uh, work out of Florida. And then would be Brianna. Brianna is our first biological child, so she's the oldest, but not really. Um, she's the oldest to us, but not the oldest in, in, in age. Um, she and her husband, they were married about a year ago, a uh, year ago May. She and her husband are missionaries in Peru, and they are serving in our Bible school. Right now, they're short-term with Baptist Midmissions. Their plan is to be able to come back to the States whenever he's able to get a visa. He is Peruvian, a Peruvian national. Um, they'd like to come back to the States so he could finish his uh, master's degree at Faith Baptist Bible College in Iowa to be able to go back and work full-time there in the Bible school and also uh, participate in, in some church planting efforts there in, in the Urubamba Valley. His name is Marco, and they are uh, serving the Lord there in Urubamba. He's, he's one of the professors at our Bible school. He's actually teaching, or he was last semester teaching, last year teaching eight classes, so he keeps himself pretty busy. So he needs to get away from Peru for a little bit so he can finish his master's degree. Keeps himself too busy to do that. Um, the next one would be Sonia. Sonia um, is married. She got married in the month of March and she and her husband, her husband's name is Caleb. A little confusing there because we also have a Caleb. But Sonia and, and, and her husband Caleb uh, live in, in uh, Florida also. And then finally is Caleb, our youngest, and he is getting ready to get married in September, um, and, and he lives in Greenville, South Carolina, and then we plan on heading back to Peru after the wedding. Our, our tickets to get back to Peru are on September, October 10th, so, all right, thank you. I, I carry my memory with me everywhere I go. 
<laughs> I didn't have it last time, so that's why I was very forgetful last time. All right, I trust you have your Bibles open to Acts chapter 2. And thank you, Joe, for reading the passage for us this morning. And um, I would like to just share a few thoughts with you um, on, on, on the idea of missions and, and, and how we approach missions, how we approach sharing the gospel. And um, I'll be speaking primarily from this chapter in Acts chapter 2, and then also we'll be going to Acts chapter 17. So, in Acts chapter 2, the passage that Joe read, uh, Peter is speaking. We all know who Peter is, right? And, he, and, and it's important that we see who he is speaking to. It says, but Peter, standing up with the eleven, this is verse 14, Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. Who is he speaking to? Pardon me? Men of Judea. He's speaking to the Jewish people, okay? He's speaking to Jews. That's important to, to have in mind as we read through this passage and, and, and look at what he says and what the results are, okay? So he's speaking to primarily, well, uh, as far as we know, there are many, many um, Jewish people in Jerusalem at that time for the feast of the Passover, but they came from many, many, many countries. They were from all over the world, actually, and, and it, 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 they were there with one accord, and and, and the, the disciples were there, and, and then they, the, the Holy Spirit came upon them. They started speaking in tongues, and the people that came from other countries were, were, were Jewish people, but they had come from other countries. They did not all speak the same language, but when they heard the speaking, they were hearing in their own language, and God moved among them. And then Peter gets up, and he starts speaking. There, some of them... Were, were very attentive to what, what, what was being said. Some of them were very moved by what was being said, but others were a little bit critical. One of the things they said was that those who were speaking in tongues were, were drunk. They, they'd, been, they'd been drinking a little too much, and Peter corrects that. Verse, four, verse 15 says, For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. Verse 16, But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Again, who is he speaking to? He's speaking to Jews. So when he mentioned the prophet Joel, did they know what he was talking about? Of course they did, because they were Jews. They'd been trained up, they'd been brought up in the Jewish traditions their whole life from childhood. And when the prophet was mentioned, they knew what he was talking about. And so he could have mentioned any prophet at this point, and they would have understood what he was talking about because they were trained in the Jewish tr tradition. They were taught. I'm not saying they believed. I'm not saying they believed. I'm saying they knew what he was talking about. They had head knowledge. They had a base knowledge of what, what he was talking about. So when he's, he mentioned the name of Joel, the prophet, none of them was, who's that? Do you know who Joel? They weren't asking each other who this could be talking about. They knew exactly who he was talking about because they were Jews, all right? So when he mentions the name, of, the name of Joel, they know what he's talking about. And so he goes on and he talks a little bit about what Joel said, verse 17, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith the Lord, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and all, all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in heaven beneath, blood and fire and vapor and smoke, uh, vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before that great and notable day of the Lord come. So when he talked about that great and notable day of the Lord that was going to come, they, again, they, they knew what he was talking about. And I, I'm not saying they believed, but they knew what he was talking about because they had a basic knowledge. They had a head knowledge, at least, of what he was talking about. These were not strange words to them. Okay? 
And so, verse 21, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Verse 22, Ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth. Did they know what he was talking about there? Yes, because they had just crucified him not too long before. Okay, so Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. So now he's going to tie these things together. What the prophet Joel said, what was happening that day, and what they had done not too long before in the crucif cruc crucifixion of, of, of Jesus of Nazareth. He's going to tie all this together. Verse 24, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the, the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him. Now he talks about David. And this is how he's going to tie it all together. Because when he brings up David, he, he specifically says, David was speaking about Jesus of Nazareth. So he's going to tie it all together. Okay? David speaketh concerning him. I foresaw the Lord always before my face. For he is on my right hand, and I should not be, be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my, fla my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. And he goes on and talks about what David talks about, and David is talking about Jesus of Nazareth. Did they know, okay, did they know David? Did they, when, when David had mentioned, did they know who he was talking about? They knew who he was talking about. They also knew what David had written. What they didn't know is who David was speaking about. And so now he puts it all together and he says, David was saying this, and the person he was saying it about is Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth whom ye have crucified. Okay, are we following so far? All right. <clears throat> Verse 32. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof ye all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which ye now see and fear. Okay, and, see, and so he, he, he talks about Jesus, and, and, he, and, and I mean, he talks about David and what David said, verse 34, For David is not ascended into, heaven, into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand. So David is calling this descendant of his, my Lord, verse 35, Until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Boom, he just puts it out there. And what happens next? Verse 37, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Is the Lord working in their hearts? The Lord is working in their hearts. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of, the, of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that, that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Was there a harvest? There was a very large harvest. Can you imagine 3,000 people getting saved and getting baptized the same day. <laughs> this, can, can you imagine that, Pastor? I, 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 can't, I can't even picture it. We're going to have a baptism today. A young man's going to get baptized. And praise the Lord for that. But you just don't see 3,000 people getting, getting baptized nowadays. There were 3,000 souls saved and baptized, added to the church how did that happen? Well, God used what these people already knew. They'd been taught their whole life the things that Peter ties together for them. He puts it all together 
The Lord turns on the, 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 their understanding. Their, they get it. Boom. The light bulb goes on. They understand now what Joel's been talking about, what David's been talking about. Peter puts it all together. They see now that the person they crucified not too long ago really is the promised Messiah. And they believe and they're baptized and 3,000 3, souls are added. And then just a few days later, there were 5,000 souls added. And then it talks about other people were added every day. So a lot of people getting saved because the message that, the message that Peter shared with them, he shared in such a way that he used, he, he knew who he was talking to. He knew his audience and he knew that they already had a head knowledge about spiritual things and about God and about what God had promised and about what he had promised through his prophets. And so when the time came for Peter to preach, their hearts were prepared and God worked. Now let's go to Acts chapter 17. We're going to see something a little different in Acts chapter, chapter 17. <clears throat> And here, the Apostle Paul is going to be the one speaking, and he's going to be speaking to a completely different audience. Paul is in Athens, and he is not speaking to the Jews. He is speaking to a pagan people, okay? A pagan people, people who did not have that background knowledge, that basic head knowledge at least. They had not been trained up in the traditions. They did not know who the prophets were. They did not know what the law was. They didn't know any of that stuff. So Paul walks around Athens and he sees all of the altars that the very religious people of Athens had raised up in their town to worship all of these many, many gods. And among the many altars that they'd raised up, they had put up an altar to the unknown God. This was just in case we missed one. We don't want him to get mad at us. We want him to be appeased too. And sorry, we don't know your name, but just in case you exist, here's your altar too. Okay? And Paul's walking around town and he sees the altars and he sees that one. And he uses that occasion to speak to them. Verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. The King James says superstitious. It's really religious. Okay, that's the idea behind it. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship him I declare unto you. What's he saying? If Paul would have started out by saying, the prophet Joel said, what would these people have gotten out of that? Nothing. Because they didn't have that. They didn't, that was not part of their training, their teaching, their understanding. They didn't know any of those things. Even if he'd have mentioned David, they might have understood that David was a king of Israel at one time. They might have known historical facts, but no idea about the te teachings of David. And so he, he uses, he, he knows his audience, and he, he speaks to him, or to them, to his audience at that moment. Okay? <clears throat> God, that made the world and all things therein, Seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. So instead of talking about what Joel said or David said, he starts talking about the existence of God and how we know God really does exist. That altar that they had built, David says, you worship him out of ignorance. You don't know who he is. You know nothing about him. Well, I'm going to introduce him to you. He is the one that did what? That made the universe. He is the God that created you and me and everything that exists. He starts by, by going to creation, not going to the Old Testament prophecies. He goes to what they can understand. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. 
and hath made, hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. What's he doing? He's talking about the proofs that God really does exist. That unknown God that you have made an altar for, okay, that unknown, that God that is unknown to you, I know him, here he is. He is the creator of everything that exists. He's the one who established the boundaries of all the nations. He did everything. He put it all together for us to live and to enjoy him. Okay, <clears throat> let's see, I lost my place. Verse 27, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after, feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also as your own poets have said, for, this are, for, for we are also his offspring. He's talking about the existence, proofs that God really does exist, the proof that God exists is that we exist. Okay, God is not part of creation. He is the creator. He is the one that made everything. And, and if not for him, we would not even exist. Where was I? Uh, verse 29. For as much then as we are, his, are, are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. Okay, that God that you've raised up an altar to, you cannot represent him with gold or silver or stone or wood or any other material because he does not exist as stone or gold or silver or any other material. Okay, so he's explaining that God does exist even though we can't see him because, you know, people like to... like. People like to see what they're worshiping. That's why idols are so popular in the world, is because people like to see what they're worshiping. Well, not this God, because he created everything, and he is an invisible God. He does not exist as gold or silver or anything like that. Verse 30, In the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Okay, so now he's getting down to some nitty-gritty. He's, he's coming to some of the same, conclu to the same conclusion that Peter did, but he's coming at it from a different direction. He's pre preaching the same gospel, but he's, he's got his, his audience in mind. He knows who he's talking to, and so he, he, the approach is not different in the sense that it's extra-biblical. It's biblical. Like Peter, his approach was biblical, but it's a little different um, emphasis, a little different focus because of the people he's talking to, and they, they, some of them get it. Some of them get it. Verse 31, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath whereof he hath given assurance to all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. Okay, who's he talking about? He's talking about Jesus, talking about the same person Peter did. The same person Peter did. But now these people are starting to, to have a little bit more understanding because he brought, he brought Jesus into, into the conversation, into, into the subject by saying that God that created everything, he has appointed a man who will one day judge the world. That gets their attention. But, you know, people are a little finicky sometimes. And so they're all ears until then. But as soon as he mentions um, that, God, that, that God raised that man, Jesus, from the dead... He loses some of them. Verse 32, And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. And others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them. Howbeit, certain men clave unto him and believed. Was there a harvest? Yeah? Was it 3,000 souls? No. Okay? 
Howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed, among the which was Dionysius and uh, the Areopagite, I'm not sure how you say that word, and a woman named Damaris and others with them. Yes, there was a harvest. Two people are named by name that got saved. There were others who are not mentioned by name. There was a harvest, but it wasn't 3,000 souls. Okay? What is the difference between what Peter or the people Peter, Peter was preaching to and the people Paul is preaching to? The difference is Peter was preaching to people who had a basic knowledge, basic background in their teaching about the existence of God and God's promises through the, the, the prophets and, and all of that. They, they knew what he was talking about. Paul, on the other hand, is speaking to people who have absolutely no knowledge of God. Very religious. So religious, in fact, that they raised up an altar just in case they'd forgotten about some God or didn't know about some God. They raised up an altar to not, you know, to not get him upset, to appease him. And so Paul approaches them from that point of view. There was a harvest in both in both situations, the harvest with the people who had been prepared all their life. I mean, they'd been hearing this and God had been using their knowledge to prepare their hearts for that day, 3,000 souls. The people who had no knowledge, this is all new to them, but they got it anyway, were very few. Now, our country, the United States of America, was founded on biblical principles. I am not saying that they were all Christians. I'm saying that, that our country was founded by people who had at least some background information <laughs> about the principles of God's Word and that these principles work. Some of them were believers, some of them were not. But they knew that what the Bible said would be a good thing to apply when founding a nation because they were biblical principles, they came from God, and that's got to be a good thing. Okay, so our nation was founded on biblical principles. And back then, when they talked about one nation under God, indivisible, people kind of had an idea what they were talking about because people back then had, had, had knowledge they, didn't, they weren't all believers, but they had knowledge because they come from various churches um, in, 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 in Europe and in other places, and they had come with a basic knowledge of who God was and that, that the Bible had some good things in it from, that, from, from God. And so, and so they had a basic knowledge, okay? But that has changed. That has changed. And there are people who are militantly trying to take God completely out of the picture. Okay? Completely take God out of the picture to where it is illegal <laughs> to do certain things that God tells us we should do. Okay? Like praying. Okay? It was God's intention for us to only pray behind our closed doors. No, God intended for us to be able to pray anywhere. At any time, in public or in secret, anywhere, we, God, God created us with, with the need to communicate and commune with Him on, on a daily basis and on a, any, every, you know, pray without ceasing. That was God's intention. But now they're making it, or they have made it, illegal to pray in certain places. They're, they're folks, and, and I'm, I'm not trying to step on anybody's toes. I'm just trying to, to, to open up our eyes to who we are working with. Okay? Are we where our nation was founded 200 and some odd years ago? No, we're not. Um, it's getting more and more difficult to be able to be a Christian openly and share the gospel with people than it has ever been before in our country. 
And to be honest with you, we come back from, from Peru every four years. Okay, we're gone for four years. We come back to the United States. We get off that plane, and you know what? It's never the same country we left four years ago. It's always a different country. Same name, same name, but it's not the same country anymore because you notice it when you've been out of, out of it for four years, okay? You get off the plane and you notice the changes that have been made. And not all of the changes are due to COVID, all right? It, our society it has changed in the last four years greatly, probably more than at any other time that we've noticed, okay? Every time we come back, we see differences. This time, the differences are just glaring, glaring. And to be honest with you, the United States right now looks more like Athens than the crowd Peter was speaking to. So how are we going to reach our country today? How are we going to reach the United States of America today? Well, I think, I think we need to, number one, stop assuming that people are going to know what you're talking about when you, when you mention the name of Jesus. Because to them, the name of Jesus is just a swear word. Okay? Um, we cannot just assume that when you talk about God, they're going to know who you're talking about. Because that information has just been gradually deleted <laughs> over the years. And people, some do, okay? Some do know what you're talking about. But not everybody. You can't assume that they're going to know because that's, that information has been suppressed from their minds. So maybe we should take a little bit of an approach like Paul did and not just assume that people are going to know what we're talking about when we start talking about the gospel and Christ died for our sins, that the payment of our sins is death, and Christ paid our price, our, our debt, our payment. He paid with his death on the cross. They're not going to necessarily just know what you're talking about. I don't know. Has anybody here been to the Creation Museum or to the Ark down in Kentucky? Barb has. Anybody else? And I'm not promoting it, okay? I'm not promoting it. Um, in fact, I don't necessarily agree with everything. But they do have an interesting approach because they're approaching people with the gospel of Christ from the same place that Paul did, talking about the existence of God and that he is the creator and that what he says is a fact. <laughs> it's true. Okay? That's their approach. And, and, and uh, some things, I'm not, the things, I, I'm, let me just back up. Okay, start over. <laughs> um, I'm not in full, full agreement with everything they say and everything they do and, and all of their um, methods, okay? But I think they do have something right as far as the approach that they're taking. And I think we might ought to consider doing that. I mean, yes, when you're witnessing to somebody, maybe... The Romans road is the way to go if they have a little bit of background knowledge about anything. But maybe the approach of Paul and, and, and the fact that God even exists at all might, might be a, 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 an approach we can also implement depending on who we're talking to at that moment. When my mother passed away four years ago, four years, yeah, four years ago, a little, a little more than four years ago now, it's actually going to be five years in October. But anyway, um, my dad got all of us seven kids, okay? We have seven kids, but my parents also had seven kids. I had to cheat to get there. <laughs> um, but uh, when, when, when mom passed away, my dad got, got all of us seven kids together in his living room, and he said, all right, go through everything, go through the house, go through the drawers, take anything you want. Because whatever you don't take, it's going somewhere. 
I'm either going to sell it or give it away or burn it or something, but take what you want, take it now because it's not going to be here for long. I'm selling out and I'm going back to Peru. He was only 86 at the time. And I said, well, Dad, how long are you going back to Peru for? And he says, Tim, I'm just going to take it like I always have, four years at a time. <laughs> that was his answer. He, he sold his house, sold everything. I mean, he, he sold everything he could possibly pinch any kind of a penny out of. And he, 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 he garage sales, whatever. He sold his house, sold his car, sold his, he had a little pickup truck, sold that. I, he might have even sold a couple of grandkids, I'm not sure. But he sold everything he could. <laughs> and he went back to Peru and he started a creation museum because he wanted to reach the people of Peru, but not just the people of Peru. Okay, Peru is a, a huge tourist attraction, and people from all over the world go to Peru to see what? Machu Picchu, okay? It's only three hours from where the museum is. And so my dad started the museum with the idea of reaching people, Peruvian people, whoever can come, and also reaching the foreigners who come to Peruvian, uh, to, to see the Peruvian ruins and, and attractions. And so my dad invested everything he had in starting a creation museum. He actually started it 63 years ago when he first arrived in Peru. Because as soon as he stepped off of the plane, he started finding fossils. Back then, people weren't really looking for fossils, at least not in Peru. And so everywhere he'd go, my dad is a fossil magnet, OK? He just, everywhere he looks, he's finding fossils. Seashells at 12,000 feet above sea level. I mean, rhinoceros heads petrified in the jungle of Peru, OK? I mean. That's the kind of stuff he's been finding for 63 years. Thousands of fossils. And he said, why not start a museum, bring people in, and preach the gospel to them through this museum? And so that's what he did. The museum is, is, is finished. Uh, the building is built. He invested everything he had in, in the building, and it's open to the public. There are some... There are some uh, loose ends that need to be tied up and just a few, you know, the, the, the administration of it and all of that needs to be polished just a little bit to get it to working really well. But we've had people come in, not just Peruvians, we've had foreigners come in and do a tour of the, of the museum, get a gospel track, get a presentation of the gospel, um, and, and hear about God actually existing and being the creator. So that's, that's one of the ways that my dad has been used of the Lord in Peru. With some people, we use the Romans Road. With some people, we use the museum. But God is doing a work in Peru. He really is. Tonight, we're going to share with you some specifics about what God is doing. And I know time... Oh, you're, you're not going to invite me back next time. I better finish. Anyway, come back tonight, and you'll see some pictures and hear a little bit more specific about... Uh, a, a specific report about what God has been doing in the last four years that we've ba been back in Peru since the la last time I was here. So we invite you back for that. And um, I think I'm just going to stop right there. Let's pray, all right? And I'll turn it over to uh, 